And for our first talk, actually, we will have a very experienced speaker, uh, Ben Nuttall, uh, with us. So uh, welcome, Ben. Hello. Uh, I'm really sorry. I, I've, I've only just got audio back. I didn't hear it. Uh... Oh, that's all right. Uh, we just want to know, like, uh, so yeah, I guess you're getting your presentation ready. And um, so you're calling in in UK, right? If I yeah, remember correctly. Um, yeah, based in Cambridgeshire, yeah. Yeah, so uh, it's amazing that like you got to tell us something about uh, the news. Uh, so I know you work for BBC uh, News Lab, and then uh, I always want to know how it operates and uh, how people can, uh, you know, uh, know about all this news and stuff. So uh, yeah, uh, when you're ready, uh, I'll let, let you take us away. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, can you see my slides okay now? Yeah. Great. Okay. So um, yeah, thank you for that. And um, welcome, everyone. So um okay here we are so my name is ben i'm a software engineer in uh, bbc news labs um i used to work for the raspberry pi foundation you may have seen me speak uh, about raspberry pi before I'm based in cambridgeshire in the uk and uh, you can find me on on the web and on twitter and github um so a bit about bbc news labs so we're an innovation team within bbc news uh, and bbc r d uh, we build prototypes of new audience experiences we um we come up with solutions to help journalists, and we uh, we we do research. We try out ideas um, and do projects on that kind of basis. Um, we write up about uh, write up our projects at bbcnewslabs.co.uk, and we're also on Twitter, uh, so you can follow us there. So I'm going to be talking uh, to you about a, a project we did with the Radio Four Today program. Uh, this is one of the BBC's flag flagship news programs, on Radio Four. Um, so if you if you uh, cast your memories back to 1957, uh, this is the year that the, the Today program launched. So uh, back in 1957, the, uh, the Today program, I imagine, would have been recorded on a microphone that looked something like this and would have been listened to on radio devices uh, that looked something like this. And um, obviously, it was just broadcast on the radio. There was um, no other options beyond um, listening to this live. Um, so. If we come forward to 2021, uh, this is what um, this is what the world looks like. So now uh, people can listen to the program um, in a whole manner of different ways. So there's all these different ways that people can consume the content that we provide. Um, they can consume it on their smartphone, on a smart TV, or smart speakers. Um, obviously, digital radio as well. Um, but they also have the um, the, bit, the main difference is that they have the the, the difference between uh, or the option between. Uh, listening live and listening on catch-up. So there's various different catch-up services uh, that people can listen to. They can listen to the whole program um, after the fact, uh, after it's gone out, uh, or they can listen to clips of it or little, little bits uh, or, or whatever they want to. Um, and also a kind of a separate thing is that um, there's also things like Twitter conversations that happened around stories that are that are on things like the Today program. So if some MP comes on or some minister is, is on the show as a guest and says something outrageous and everybody's talking about it on Twitter. And people are often sort of, even if they're not listening to the program, they're seeing all the kind of fallout of what is going on on uh, programs like this that are very can, can get very heated. Um, so there's lots of different ways that people can kind of get involved in programs and uh, that, that we put out and things like that, uh, very different to how it was 50 or more years ago. Um, so if we take a look at the, the production workflow for how um, the, the producing teams uh, put together these programs. So they use a, um, a, a tool called Open Media, which looks like this. Um, it's, uh, they use it to plan their running orders. So this contains uh, a list of the stories that are going to be in the program um, with, with the, you know, the order of the stories, all of the timing information, uh, the script, uh, the guest names, the media objects they've used, and uh, within the program, and that kind of thing, uh, they basically create a draft in this in this tool, and then they modify it as the plans change, as they confirm guests, as they um, you know bring st stories further up the running order. They they might chop and change things, uh, and even when they're on air, they're still making adjustments and you know moving things around. If if one guest takes long, you know, takes longer to answer a question than they expected, and everything everything moves moves around accordingly. Uh, and they can still chop and change and choose what goes in. If this is a three-hour program, so you know they plan it ahead, but they might uh, things might move along. Um, and so uh, this goes out on air. Um, uh, it's on from seven a.m. to to ten a.m. Uh, every weekday. And um, so you know they're in there, they're in the studio, they're producing it. It's going out live at ten o'clock. 
it's all over and they they can finally put put this uh, this running order uh, away because it's finished. Um, and then shortly after the program's finished, shortly after 10 o'clock, uh, this becomes available on catch up. So on, on the web, on the BBC Sounds app and, and various other places, uh, this will become available for people who want to watch it on uh, to listen on catch up. Um, and so problem is, this is a three hour program. And the way that we, you know, in recent years, we've started to make this available as catch up. Uh, the way that we produce it, uh, the way that we provide it to people as catch up is just a three hour dump of the audio. It's just, well, here is what was on the radio earlier, this three hours of this segment of this program. Um, and there's no information about what's in the program. There's no nothing that doesn't tell you anything about the presenters, the guests that were on, the stories that were covered. Uh, it's got the same generic description every day. And um, and if you hear about an interesting debate that was on the program, you know, good luck finding it. If you you know, if you've heard about it on Twitter, there was this really good bit where Sudden Search said this. Um, you're not likely to be able to um, to find that within the uh, within the program because you've got to scrub along that bar uh, three hours long and try and find what you know that thing that you heard about. Um, so in news labs, we tend to do a lot of kind of what if questions. So we were thinking, well, what what if we could actually take all that running order data that we started with because we had all that data to begin with? What if we could uh, use that to enrich the digital offering that we put out by harvesting that data from the from the running order? Um, and what else could we do if we if we did do that? So once we've reapplied that data to the content, um, what else do the, does this allow us to do? And there's um, there's a concept within uh, particularly within uh, BBC R and D called uh, object based media, um, and this is a, a sort of a, an ideology where you you know you can chop up programs that were were made for linear broadcasting. You chop them up and provide them to people in different ways, and allow people to. Uh, consume small amounts of programs and and have customized, personalized views of of, um, of all these different bits of content. Uh, so there's lots of stuff to play with. But once you've got the once you've actually um, surfaced it and chopped it up in, and made it available with all that data. Um, and uh, there's there's also you know as I said lots of personalization options. So a really really bog standard simple example could be rather than you know, uh, recommending to people, oh, have you thought about watching the Andrew Marr show or the listening to the Today program or watching Newsnight or listening to the, the world at one? Um, instead of just recommending programs to people, you might want to give them more personalized uh, choices in what you're, what you're presenting. So instead of the, the Andrew Marr show, you might say, here is a clip of your MP on the Andrew Marr show. Here is a, here is a section from... Um, uh, you know, a, a, an interview or a, an interview about uh, Joe Biden here. You know that you, that you might be interested in. Here is a clip from N Nicholas Watt. You read some articles that he wrote. Here is uh, that. You know, his, here is our our insights on the story about Dominic Cummings uh, from you know that we talked about on, on World at One. That kind of thing. Instead of recommending programs, you could you know choose more personalized sections to recommend, which might be more fruitful. Uh, so um, how do we extract that running order data? So unfortunately, there's no export from this program. So it's not, this isn't a, a trivial uh, problem to, uh, to start with. Um, the way that this works is um, something called the MOS protocol, which is an industry, industry standard um, called uh, MOS, uh, the Media Object Server. Uh, this is about sending XML messages back and forth between what they call newsroom computer systems and the media servers and the cameras, the automation, the auto queue. All the kind of things that are in the studio that need to rely on, you know, quick communications of uh, changes within this running order, um, and so it's, it's based on this industry standard protocol. So we started to look at that, and um, for a given program, there'll be, you know, there might be several hundred of these Moz messages. So each of them is an XML file uh, that describes what the change was. So what 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 happens is they send. They, 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 they create a new running order and it emits a message saying row create. And then for every change that they make to the running order, if they swap a story, uh, you know, swap stories around in different orders, if they add a new story, if they add a media item, if they change, you know, one of the details of something, every little change that they make is sent, emitted as a different XML message in the, according to this standard. And it might be that one of the cameras needs to be aware of one of the changes. So it, it receives the message and it, and it deals with that accordingly, that kind of thing. And so we're able to, um, we thought, you know, maybe we we're able to piece the running order together from all of these messages. Um, so 
Uh, so if we take a look at um, inside a couple of these MOS files, so this is the the top the top end of one the, the first file that you get the row create. Um, so you can see there it's got uh, things like a you know it's got a row create tag, it's got a message ID, it's got a, a row ID, running order ID, and a row slug, um, and and details about you know when the when the when the program is due to start and that kind of thing. Uh, it's got all this data in in XML format, and then you know the next message that might get, might be sent might be this one, the row story send. So this is one where they're adding the body to a story. So they might have written the script, and they say, well, here is the script for that story that we started with. And every single message contains something like this that you've got to you know it has a particular structure, and you've got to be able to understand how how the structure works. Uh, so uh, we investigated like parsing and merging these XML messages based on you know the details within the MOS specification, and and it really seemed to work. So uh, we put this together, and, and you know we wanted to be able to put this together into into a solution that would take a whole batch of hundreds of messages from a program and condense it down into one big merged you know run, complete running order. Um, so uh, we were able to to do this, and we create uh, we developed a library that we called it Mozro Manager, which is the, the Moz running order manager. Uh, it's open source, uh, it's an open source Python library. Um, it's Apache 2 licensed and it's available on the BBC GitHub and uh, the docs are available on Read the Docs. Um, so what can it do? So this this library, it can uh, it merges Moz files into a machine readable running order. So if you've got a collection of files, it will merge them all together and pr produce one that you can that you can use. Uh, it provides easy access to the contents of each of the MOS files or, or the complete running order. And it, it's provided as a library, so you can import it and do things to it sort of kind of custom. And there's also a command line interface for the sort of basic general uh, tasks that you might want to do. And because this is a, an industry-wide standard, you know, it's useful being open source. Other, other broadcasters might be able to make use of this as well. So uh, the way it works is we've got... Um, uh, MOS type classes. So uh, every MOS file is uh, MOS file type is provided as a class. Um, you can see there's a hierarchy there. The MOS file base class, um, and then all the all the uh, subclasses like story send and story move. They provide specific implementation details about how each of those types work and how they interact with each other. Um, so uh, you can create a, a running order object from a row create file. Um, and then you've got a running order object that you can play with. And you, similarly, you can create a story send object from a file like this, and you can um, you can manipulate that object and access the bits uh, of that object. Um, alternatively, instead of using the uh, the actual classes, the the subclasses that you want to use, um, you can just use the you, you can construct them from the base class, um, and this will allow you to um, um, it, it to detect and classify. The, the type for you so that you can much more easily uh, automate these processes. Uh, so, um, and uh, alternatively from creating from a file, you can also uh, create um, an object from a string. So if you've, if you've already parsed an XML string from somewhere, you can just create an object from that. And what we use quite a lot in the BBC is um, the from S3 class method, which means you, which allows you to construct a, uh, one of these objects from a file in an S3 bucket. Uh, the way that works is uh, we have um, the, basically the base class has an init, uh, but you don't, don't generally use that directly. Uh, you use the, the from class methods. They take different parameters according to what, what they are, the file name or the, the XML string or whatever. Um, and they uh, they pass that, you know, they read the um, the XML, however, they they need to do that, whether it's from the from the file or from the string or from the S3 bucket, they get that XML and pass that to the um, well, it runs it through the cl the classifier, and then that that um, uh, returns a, an instance of the the subclass, uh, which is quite neat. Uh, so, um, property access. So once you've got an object representing a MOS file, um, you can easily read the data uh, within it without needing to know where exactly it is within the XML. Uh, for instance, the the row slug is a property here, which uh, retrieves the string from the uh, the row slug tag within the row create tag, and um, and in other cases it might return uh, something that isn't the string. So the message ID is an integer, and and it parses the start time from from the XML document, uh, obviously as a, a date time object. So having things like that, you know, uh, can be really useful. 
Um, and the duration is a, is a float, but that's not just read from the file. That's the sum of all the durations of all the stories within that running order. So it kind of goes another level deeper. Um, and row.stories here is, is actually a list of story objects, which is another abstraction, which I'll come on to next. Um, so there's this concept um, called uh, escape hatches and ejector seats, which is uh, written about by Anvil uh, on their blog, which is a really good read. Um, basically, when you provide an abstraction to something, you, you have a choice to either let people use the escape hatch uh, and still access the advanced stuff. You know, you say, right, if you need anything else, you know, it's in here. Uh, or the, otherwise, you know, they, they would have to ditch the library and go back to like parsing the XML themselves in this example. Um, um, so what what we do here is we you know yes we provide row dot, uh, dot um, row slug and dot stories and things like that, but if you need anything else, just poke inside row dot xml, which is the element tree that we're abstracting uh, anyway. Um, so then within um, within something like um, uh, within a, a running order, if you access those stories, um, so that's a list of stories. Pull out the first one, <clears throat> and again similarly we've got. Um, We've got uh, further abstraction. So within the story, you've got its slug, its duration, and its script, and, and lots of other things. Um, the way that that is defined is the, a property within the running order, which says, well, go and find all of the story tags within the XML uh, and construct a, a list of story objects, which provides that further abstraction underneath. So it just means whenever you access row.stories, you know, it's going and reading the XML, but providing them in, in this in this nice uh, accessible way. And again, with uh, the escape patch thing, you can access the XML within a story, even though we've wrapped it up in this story class. And so uh, one of the main things I was talking about was merging these messages together. So as well as just poking inside and having a look at the contents, you want to be able to merge them together. So uh, if we, for instance, take a, uh, a running order uh, file um, and um, and a story insert file. So a story insert will insert a new story into the running order. We can see here, we start off with a running order that has 10 stories within it. Um, and if we use the plus operator, uh, here we're using plus equals to add it to the existing running order. We've now, that has now applied the merge. So it's taken the story insert, merged it into the running order. And now we've got a running order, which is 11 stories long rather than 10. The way that works is we have uh, Dunder add, so an add mag magic method on the running order uh, class. <clears throat> and we have, and then we have <coughs> a, uh, a merge method on each uh, other, each of the other subclasses. So that did that, uh, you know, each merge class determines how, or how does this particular type apply a merge? Um, and, and it gets called by, you know, you, you running the add on the running order. Um, so the, there's comprehensive documentation for this uh, available. So um, uh, you know we uh, it's on on read the docs, and we also uh, we follow something called the Deer Taxis framework, which is uh, made by Daniele Procida. Um, this is all a concept where you separate your docs pages between what are tutorials, how to guides, uh, explanation, and reference, um, and it's a really good way of organizing and structuring your documentation. So it's well worth a look. Um, so how do we utilize this uh, within News Labs? So we have a, a suite of AWS tools that we've written, which uh, you know comprises uh, several lambdas and DynamoDB tables and things. And we um, we use the Mosra Manager library uh, within the, the context of these lambdas to process the Mos, MOS files uh, for the programs that we that we have access to uh, once they arrive in S3. So we have something that that sends them into S3 that triggers jobs to be run and and then we kind of store things like well we've extracted all the the list of all the stories and these are all the episodes that we've processed and these are the different things that we've pulled out um, and then we've got all that information available in uh, both in the completed running order that we've saved uh, and passed on to a document store but also in all of our um, DynamoDB tables as well. Um, and once processing is complete, we you know we've sent that file over to uh, the document store, and then other people can subscribe to that and trigger their own events to say, well, once you've finished processing that thing, we could we could actually run our own job and do our own thing based on that. So anyone within the BBC might be able to make use of this as well. Um, so if we take a look inside the um, uh, the lambda, so 
we've got this internal library called MozPipe, which is kind of specific to the way that we do this within the AWS suite. Um, this allows us to kind of have shared utilities for things like talking to the DynamoDB tables, or, you know, across all of the lambdas. They all have a copy of this this internal library in in the lambdas, um, and we've uh, you know the the, uh, the the processing lambda, for instance, looks something like this. So we we import the database client and the processing uh, class from MozPipe, uh, and we have two entry points which are do roughly the same thing. So the, the lambda handler is what is executed when it's running in the lambda context, and the if main is uh, if name is main. Um, these both both of these uh, create a processing object, a processing object from um, from some parameters. And they um, and then you call that object um, to execute the processing task. So those parameters have either come from the event context in which the lambda is being called, uh, or from command line arguments. And this allows us to uh, run the lambda equivalently, uh, both locally and within AWS. Um, so then, the if we take a look at the Moz the MozPipe library, so uh, this is how you make an object callable, like uh, like I showed there. So we've got processor, and you you've got the brackets after it. So calling that object is um, made possible by this Dunder call method, so the ma magic method for call. Uh, and essentially, that's just a, a kind of a way of um, it. Just the, in the in the in this example, it's providing a um, a sequence of method calls, which you you know you could otherwise run separately. But it's just a way of pr providing that all in one method and just making it callable, uh, which is quite nice. Um, so part of the suite of tools is um, something that populates a status dashboard so that we can monitor programs being processed and uh, catch any processing errors and check when programs are stuck in pending, if they haven't had their road delete file saying they've finished, that kind of thing. Uh, and this was crucial for ironing out the edges in the uh, uh, the edge cases, sorry, in the in the merge implementations, um, and gives us a high level view of what's going on. Um, we also have a, a programs directory, which is written out in, this, in a similar way. Uh, this allows us to kind of browse, and we have this web app. We can we can browse all the programs that we've processed and view um, all the episodes that we have for for a program, and view the stories within the running order, the timing information, the script, and all that kind of thing. Um, so you can see that here. So we've got an episode of Newsnight there, and we've got a list of stories that take place and what, at what point in the in the in the program that the story happens. And then there's a you can click through to view the script for the whole thing as well. Um, so um, we we ran a trial last month with uh, Radio Four Today, uh, where we added chapter data to the BBC Sounds uh, web player. So you can see along here just for the final hour. We've um, decorated this timeline with each of the chapter points for the main stories. So um, this allowed listeners to, you know, using the catch-up service on the web, to see what was in the program and select sections that they wanted to listen to. Uh, so here's a, a list of all the chapters that it was b below the below the player. You could view this and either choose a story, uh, choose a story uh, to, to start or skip over one or Whatever you wanted to do, you actually had full full access and control to just dive around wherever you wanted to go to in there. Um, the uh, the final step of this process um, to get it into to, to be able to do that was um, uh, a tool called Slicer, which um, uh, once it's been through the Mozilla Manager processing, uh, this is a um, this tool allows somebody from the Radio Four Today program team. To you know, correct the story offsets and you know move everything slightly if they needed to, uh, add custom synopses to the stories and replace things like the technical slugs that they use in the running order with more human human friendly uh, titles, um, and then it went for for publication from there. So it kind of went through a, a system of pre-processing the files that we've got from the newsroom computer system, passing them into this AWS pipeline uh, with Mozilla Manager. Sending the final document to the document store that would trigger um, a machine alignment tool called Hot Fuzz, which would take the transcript um, and align, you know, make sure it was aligned properly based on the order of the stories, uh, and then passed into that Slicer UI tool that I showed for manual, you know, confirmation and editing. Then it would go for editorial approval because the, the the program team have actually got to be responsible for what goes out and what the wording is and and all the the uh, all the details around that, and then once they're happy with it, they can publish it, and you know we'd get that out by, um, you know, as soon as possible within uh, within within that morning. So, anyone listening to the um, 
to the Today program uh, over the last month or so, you know, would have had access to this um, and all the chapter points available. Um, so what next for this? So um, one of the things we want to do with the library particularly is to gather feedback from other broadcasters to ensure it's compatible with other systems and it's not just, well, this is how the BBC does it. We wanted to make sure it's, it kind of works uh, across the board um, and I know any other edge cases that crop up. Uh, we want to roll out this kind of automated chapterization for, for the other programs, like um, uh, and including TV programs like Newsnight would be good as well. Um, we want to provide uh, accessible program data from these running orders as a service within the BBC so other people can make use of this. Because a lot of people we speak to sort of say, you know, they want to be able to do these things, but they, you know, they don't have access to that data and it's too hard to get it. So this whole process of, of having the library and extracting it all and processing it all just provides that data and makes it makes it uh, accessible. And there's plenty of scope for more object-based media type projects demonstrating opportunities uh, in this area, like further personalization and that kind of thing. And that's all from me. I think there's just a little bit of time for questions. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much. It's a really good talk. And um, yeah, I don't see any uh, questions in the matrix, but I do have a questions uh, I want to ask because this is very interesting. So I want to know that, uh, you know, what makes Python the, the tool that you choose to, uh, to analyze all these data? Like what makes Python the best language for that? <laughs> That's a good question. My, I mean, my team uh, has skills in, uh, you know, uh, in mostly Python and JavaScript um, and TypeScript, things like that as well. We um, there are bits of bits of the project all the way along uh, which use different languages. So there's some of the pre-processing stuff is kind of older stuff that's been around for a while. And so there's like bits of PHP floating around and stuff like that. There's um, there's bits of GoLang script which kind of deal with some of the Moz messages as they come in, and then we've got the Slicer UI, which is TypeScript. Um, and um, but being able to, you know, I, I, basically when I started the Moz processing, uh, we were we were just looking at, you know, doing some file I/O and and um, and parsing XML and stuff like that. And you know, the tools and the libraries and the stuff available was, you know, was. Um, it, you know, Python is very well suited for that type, that type of general purpose pro programming. So, you know, it's it's probably the one of the the less the lesser exciting bits of the, the whole project, but it was definitely the right tool for the job. I think. I think the the way I was able to do all the stuff with um, uh, the class hierarchies and the um, the you know, it's essentially the the main thing about this library is the uh, the nice abstraction and the and the, the accessible properties and things like that. So. I think that's the that's the key thing that Python brings to this. It uh, makes it a really nice library to to use. Yeah, that's great. That's good to hear as well that like Python is very useful in this uh, project in this you know processing. So uh, thank you so much, Ben. I think if people are interested and too shy to ask now, then I think they would find you uh, in the Matrix anywhere. So uh, yeah, so uh, don't be shy and ask questions. And uh, thank you so much, Ben. Thank you for your thank talk. You. I would you. like to really.